of an intro and then we'll start. Okay, well, welcome everyone tonight. Uh, this is, I'm David Kent, the president of the Lincoln Group of DC, and I wanna welcome everyone to the first of our four-part course on Abraham Lincoln's life and legacy. Uh, and this was all developed at, by the Lincoln Group uh, as part of our outreach and education program. Uh, we'll be recording this so that we can use it in various places. Um, tonight, Ed Steers is going to get us uh, started. So by looking at Lincoln's youth and his formative years and how that upbringing influenced uh, his thinking. So that'll be him tonight. Next Thursday on January 13th, um, we'll have, uh, I will be here to talk about Lincoln as a politician. So I'll go through Lincoln's political career, what issues were important and how his views may have evolved over time. The following Thursday, on January 20th, uh, I, I'll be back again with uh, talking about Lincoln as commander in chief during the, the Civil War. It's the only war that Americans fought each other that I can remember at least. And uh, so we'll talk about his role as the commander in chief. He had many other roles during the presidency, of course, but we'll focus on commander in chief. And then finally, on the last Thursday of the month on, the, on January 27th, John O'Brien will take a look at Lincoln's legacy and how we can learn from Lincoln as we address challenges ahead. And we have many challenges today that are very reminiscent of, of that time period. All of these programs are being recorded uh, for future use. We're gonna hold all of the Q&A until the end. Uh, and everyone can just simply put their questions either as they go on or hold it till the end, uh, but put their questions in the chat box at the very bottom of your screen. And John O'Brien will moderate those questions and, and get them through and Ed will answer questions as long as we can all hold up and as long as there's questions. So with that, I will turn it over to, to you, Ed. So Ed, this is Ed Steers, talk about Lincoln's youth. Thank you, David, and thank all of you for zooming in. Um, you know, in the past two years, I've participated or at least been present in more Zoom presentations with the Lincoln Group in the previous 30 years. So it's been a boom for me. The only unfortunate aspect is, of course, we can't get together personally and talk. Well, <clears throat> David and John got together uh, on this, and I drew the short straw. So uh, I get to talk about the early years, and let me explain what I mean by this. In the six-part CNN series on Lincoln Divided We Stand, which I assume most all of you watched, all or in part, a total of six hours, the first 28 years of Lincoln's life are covered in just 16 minutes, or 6% of the entire show. And in scanning several of the modern award-winning biographies, usually the Gilder Lehrman ones, of Lincoln's early years are covered from a low of 2% of the total pages to just a high of 8%. And so you're left with the impression that the first 28 years of his life are not very significant in either telling his story or in making the man Lincoln that we all know and study. Um, so, as you all know, Lincoln lived 56 years from 1809 to 1865. And what I find interesting about this is you can divide those 56 years exactly in half. From 1809 to 1837, the first 28 years of Lincoln's life, spent entirely on the Western frontier as a rail splitter, a farmer, uh, the second 28 years from 1837 to 1865, you might refer to as the cosmopolitan city life. This is where he moves into Springfield, practices law, politician, becomes a congressman, president. The difficulty, and what I was getting at, is that of all the primary documentation that exists for Lincoln, only one to two percent pertains to those first 28 years, whereas 98 to 99% refer to those second 28 years. And 
that may not be so unusual because of course what documentation is excuse me is on the on the frontier i mean i know birth certificates death certificates Mo most of the material and documentation um you know are the tax records and occasional court lawsuits but most of these records have all been lost whereas the second half or the 28 years of what i call the cosmopolitan city life you know there are five thousand legal cases they're all documented they've been pulled over courthouses collated certainly his bullet is his years as a politician and a congressman and president so this means that what i'm going to be talking about tonight and those first 28 years are mostly anecdotal whereas the second 28 years are very heavily documented just take the collected works for instance um, which heavily documents his entire life during this period well so what is the source well the source for those first 28 years of course is this guy you know william herndon his law partner for 20 years and you know, within two weeks of Lincoln's death, Herndon set out this massive research project of contacting, in the end, 255 individuals. He gathered 634 letters or interviews. Many of those run 12 and 14 pages. So we're talking about a thousand, a thousand pages of material this man collected um, to do his own biography. And fortunately, God bless them, Douglas Wilson and Ronnie O. Davis gathered all this material together and published it in a single volume, putting it at our fingertips. And that was what, in 1998. So prior to that, we had to go to the Library of Congress and dig through this if we wanted to get to any original material. Now, you know Herndon comes under severe criticism by many, many of the Lincoln historians uh, because he's dealing with people that James G. Randall characterizes as having dim and misty memories. We all know that with time, memory becomes contaminated. So there's a lot of doubt and criticism. Uh, and you've got to be extremely careful when you use Herndon's informants. Hopefully you can find corroboration uh, wherever you can. But the interesting fact is every single historian and biography uses Herndon even though at the same time they criticize him as being unreliable. That said, here we go. So to a campaign biographer, Lincoln summed up his life in a single sentence. I was born in Kentucky, grew up in Indiana and lived in Illinois. So for the first seven years of his life, 1809 to 1816, he lived on the Sinking Spring Farm the birthplace farm for two years, Knob Creek for five, which is about 15 miles away. <clears throat> From 1816 to 1830, he lived in Indiana. And this is the very, very important period, 14 years. He grows from a young boy of seven to an adult of 21. And then over the winter of 1830-31, he moves with a family near Decatur, Illinois, where he stays for one year reaches the age of majority and leaves the family and winds up in New Salem, Illinois for the final six years of this period from age 22 to 28, 1831 to 1837. So this is the United States as it looked when Lincoln was born. Uh, there were 17 states uh, in the union, 7 million people, 400,000 in Kentucky. Kentucky was the 15th state, came in in 1792. Now, when the Lincolns got to Kentucky, when Captain Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln's grandfather, brought the family, Kentucky was still a county of Virginia, which kind of played an important role in the Lincoln story because that's how Captain Abraham wound up with 5,500 acres in Kentucky, his two services in the militia. Um, so here, are Lincoln's parents as best as we can represent them. Of course, the photograph of Thomas Lincoln, a, 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 a photograph, a, a copy of a daguerreotype taken of him. Um, the providence really is rather weak on this, but it's all we have. It's the traditional picture of Thomas Lincoln. Somehow or other, we need to see the people that we talk about and that we read, write about. And so, this is, of course, accepted as the portrait of Thomas Lincoln. And on the right, you see Lloyd Ostendorf, 
once a member of the Lincoln Group at DC, famous Lincoln artist and scholar, his rendition of what Nancy Hanks looked like. She tragically died at 33. We'll get into that. But it, it, both of these are probably reasonable representations in that there are descriptions of the two people. Lloyd, being an artist, has a very keen eye for features. And so we think this probably does have a resemblance to what Nancy Hanks looked like. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because Tom and Nancy had three children, Sarah, the daughter of the first child born 1807 um, in Elizabethtown, died tragically in 1828 at the age of 21 in childbirth. Abraham, of course, 1809, and little Tommy Lincoln, 1811. Um, we feel he lived only for two to four weeks uh, at, at Knob Creek. Now, what's interesting about this to me is, if you look at, this, at, at the six American generations from Samuel Lincoln in 1637 down to Thomas Lincoln, the average number of children in those six generations of Lincolns is eight. If you go back to England and look at the five generations there, which we can document very well in a direct uh, line of ancestry, the average number of children in those five generations was nine. And here are Nancy and Thomas with two, a girl and a boy, out on the frontier trying to survive with subsistence farming. And I only point this out as part of my rehabilitation of Thomas. He's trying to survive out there with the help of one son who doesn't really become that much of a help until probably at least the age of eight, and then it's limited. And Nancy has a single, single daughter. So uh, you have to factor this in when you begin to evaluate these individuals. Well, Abraham Lincoln suffers his first great tragedy, of course, in 1818, when Nancy dies at the age of 33, what was called the milk sickness. Those of you who have read anything I've read, written, realize I, I, I don't accept the idea that she died of a neurotoxin known as trematone. I believe she died of a bacterial infection known as brucellosis, which was very common and carried to the meat and milk of cattle. Nonetheless, this is pretty devastating, of course, to Lincoln and his sister and father. Lincoln says he's in his 10th year when this happens. So 13 months later, Thomas Lincoln decides to return to Elizabethtown and propose marriage to Sarah Bush Johnston. Now, anecdotally, it's said that the two of them, uh, uh, Thomas actually courted Sarah Bush Johnston in the early days, even proposed marriage to her and she turned him down and married uh, Johnston. She had three children, uh, John D, a son, and then two daughters, Matilda and Elizabeth. So Thomas visits her and says, look, Sarah, you are a widow with three children. I'm a widower with two children. We should pool our resources, to get together and marry. And she agreed, contingent on her debts being paid off in um, Arden County. And so Thomas got a list of the deaths, went around, paid them off. On December 2nd, they were married. On the 3rd, he packed up all of her belongings, which were rather substantial, furniture, feather bed, most importantly, books. Uh, and they returned to Indiana. Matilda, her older daughter, years later told Herndon, she took the five children and mixed us up all together like hasty pudding and has not known us apart since. And if you really read, she, she left very extensive interviews. And, and if you read the things that she said, it's clear that she favored Abraham Lincoln. She, she acknowledged and recognized there was something different about Lincoln. He was extremely inquisitive um, and basically uh, somewhat shy and perhaps you could even say introverted. And she took a very special interest in him and nurturing him um, at, at all stages of his life. She was his salvation in so many ways. And we all know the famous uh, quote of Lincoln's, uh, God bless my angel mother, all I am or ever hope to be I get from her. That's usually attributed by some biographers to Nancy. I think he's clearly referring to Sarah Bush uh, his stepmother, who, uh, who, who really took care of him uh, for his young life growing up. 
She said he always had his head in the fireplace, which of course we know what that means. This wonderful painting by Eastman Johnson showing Lincoln sitting by the fireplace at night reading, a voracious reader, of course, read everything he could get his hands on. The problem is he couldn't get his hands on much. I mean, books were limited uh, on the frontier. She said he ciphered on boards when he had no paper. And when the board would get too black, he would shave it off with a drawing knife and go at it again. That's diligence. I wonder how many of us would do that when it came time to do our homework. Well, what was Lincoln's education? So I'm gonna jump forward to when Lincoln becomes a congressman, uh, 1847, and uh, every uh, Congress has a biblical, a biographical dictionary prepared from the very first one to the current one. And the members are all asked to fill out a small uh, biographical sheet, you know, the usual name, uh, birth date, place of birth, uh, marriage, children. And it gets down to the question of education and Lincoln, of course, writes that famous one word. You can look it up, defective. Um, Lincoln always viewed his education as defective. At times he seemed embarrassed about the lack of it. He at times also seemed like he desperately wanted to have gone on to higher education in college. Um, but, but this, of course, is another example of his humility. Uh, he certainly was, if not, the most intellectual and brightest president was certainly shared it with someone else. Well, Lincoln said he attended ABC schools. These were subscription schools where itinerant school teachers would come into the neighborhood, send out an announcement that they were setting up a school. You could send your children to them at $2 a head. That's very interesting. I found that figure, uh, which again, uh, can be used to support Thomas Lincoln, who presumably discouraged education, discouraged Lincoln's reading and educating himself. And yet he's willing to pay $2 a head to send Sarah and Abe to these subscription schools. Now Lincoln said his entire education totaled less or around 12 months because these schools last for one, two or three months, almost always during the winter time because in the spring, the children are needed for the plowing and planting in the fall, the harvesting and gathering, but winter was somewhat of a downtime. And so that's when they went to school. Lincoln said there's no qualification needed beyond reading, writing, uh, and ciphering to the rule of three. But ask yourselves when you're out on that very edge of the frontier in America, why do you need to know more than writing, uh, reading, and ciphering to the rule of three? Uh, and another statistic I dug up because I, I was curious that in 1830, 75% of the people were literate, which I kind of found astounding. I thought it'd be less than 20%. So there were a lot of people reading out on the frontier. Well, when he was in Kentucky those seven years at six and seven, he attended two of these particular schools, Zachariah Ronnie's and Caleb Hazel's. In Indiana, during those uh, 14 years he was there. At age 11, 13, and 15, he attended three schools, Crawford, Sweeney, and Dorsey's. I put asterisks on Dorsey's because he's different than the rest, and as is Lincoln at age 15. Dorsey is a highly educated man. He went to college. He um, is the county uh, tax commissioner. He winds up elected coroner. He owns a large store. He's a merchant. Uh, um, and so he's, he's quite educated. And as we'll see in a minute, he's teaching rather sophisticated um, material to these children. Uh, while the first four were subscription schools where you paid $2 a head, uh, by the time 1824 rolls around, Indiana is paying teachers. And so Dorsey's paid by the state of Indiana and Thomas doesn't have to pay for his children to go to school. This is the community in Indiana, uh, Little Pigeon Creek community. Um, this is Thomas Lincoln's property. He originally bought a quarter section, AB, 160 acres, and then later added 20 acres, that's C. This is where uh, James Gentry had his large store and the town centered around it, got its name Gentryville from James Gentry. And this is the location of the Little Pigeon Creek Church, 
which served as a school. Tom, uh, 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 Dorsey taught in that church at that school. And there's the graveyard there next to the church where Sarah is buried. We'll visit that in a moment. Well, another interesting statistic that I dug out, which kind of astounded me, within a four mile, mile radius of the Lincoln cabin, there were 138 children between the age of one and 17. In all, there were 45 boys, 45 girls under seven years of age, and 23 boys and 25 girls between seven and 17. And the average number of children per family, there were 40 families. Uh, I don't know if I had that on the last slide. There were 40 families in, in the Little Pigeon Creek community, and the average number of children was six. Again, Thomas is on the low end of this, having to subsistence farm with just one boy to help them. But that's a large community of kids. I mean, Lincoln obviously um, uh, was surrounded by uh, boys and girls of his own age or around his own age. And of course, they did get together at church and in other types of socials uh, from time to time. So it, it was quite a thriving community. Now, during... Hazel Dorsey's period, um, when Lincoln was 15, he kept what we call a sum book. This turns out to be a, a paper bound book of, we think about 50 pages of which only 20 survive, nine by 12, but they are filled with all sorts of exercises and homework that Lincoln did uh, mostly in the field of math. And so you see here very complicated uh, uh, multiplication on the left, simple interest on the right. Um, there is an example of the multiplication, you know, a very large number, 342,435 by 342. He does get the correct answer, but in Lincoln's day, you didn't stop there. You then had to prove it was the correct answer. So he divides and works his way backward till he gets zero, 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 which means he got the right answer. Of course, in our day, the teacher just checked it off. You're either right or wrong. You never had to prove it. So many of you may wonder, like I did, what in the world was the rule of three? Uh, we don't speak of that in today's education. And anyway, well, the rule of three dealt with ratios, proportions, uh, percentages, which was, of course, the most difficult part of, of mathematics then. And here's a very nice example of Lincoln, and it shows two things. One is Lincoln had a deal with the British system of currency and the American US system of currency. So he's asked if one gallon of ale costs eight pence, what costs 36 gallons? Sort of simple exercise. Eight pence times 36, he gets 288 pence or pennies. He knows that 12 pennies equal a shilling. So he divides by 12 and he gets 24 shillings. And he knows that 20 shillings equal a pound, so he divides 24 by 20, gets one pound, four shillings. So it's kind of interesting that he had to juggle both of these systems, uh, certainly until he went to Illinois. Well, in this sum book, and by the way, there are 20 surviving pages, I guess I indicated that, and they're scattered. Some are in historical society, some in the Library of Congress, and some are still in private, private hands, I think. But here's an example of Lincoln's beautiful cursive handwriting. He writes this little poem uh, in the book. Abraham Lincoln is my name, and with my pen I wrote the same. I wrote in both haste and speed and left it here for fools to read. Typical Lincoln. Uh, he didn't write that, though. I think he got this out of one of the spelling books, as we'll see. But I want to point out two things here. One is this beautiful handwriting, so easy to read. And I know David and John will probably back me up on this. When you have to read the primary documents of people from this period, it can really be an agony. I mean, you take William Seward and he's almost unintelligible to, to transcribe his writing. But here's Lincoln with this, with this beautiful penmanship, which also means he's extremely easy to forge. And believe me, there are lots and lots of Lincoln forgers and forgers. Joseph Cozy in the earliest 20th century made a living forging Lincoln's handwriting. And the second thing is Lincoln had problems with spelling and he had them his whole life. Name, haste, and law girl. 
he, he spelled it that way while he was president. I'd remind you of any other president. And sense with an S and wizard with two Zs. Um, I threw this in as I thought it was interesting. I don't know how many of you know this, but the peculiarity Lincoln had in his writing is he crossed his T's from right to left, unlike most or all of us who cross our T's from left to right. So I just show you four examples here so that when you actually find a Lincoln document, you'll be able to determine whether it's a forgery or the real thing. Books. So here is the meat of Abraham Lincoln's education and interest. <clears throat> this is the first book he was exposed to, the Holy Bible. This is the Lincoln Bible from uh, when uh, Nancy was alive. This Bible's on display at uh, the boyhood home in Indiana in the museum there. Um, I believe Nancy could read. I believe she taught Abraham Lincoln to read. As a young girl, she was raised at Beach Fork, Kentucky by Richard um, Berry's family. They were very well off. His children were uh, uh, educated in schools and could read. So why would Nancy not be taught to, to read? So I, I'm, I'm very well convinced she could read and taught Lincoln to read. It's not clear she could write. She signed her name with an X. Doesn't mean she couldn't write, but it probably suggests it. Now, we all know that Lincoln studied, learned, and used the Bible a great deal in his speeches and writings. Um, but it's my sense that uh, he mostly refers to the Old Testament. Lincoln is a scholar of the Old Testament more so than the New Testament. Um, and this is controversial, I realize, um, but I think Lincoln did not approach this as a spiritual book or the word of God. I think he approached it as a history book. And this is where he learned his history of early man, BC, um, from the Bible. Interestingly, uh, his stepmother, Sarah, said in later years, Abe read the Bible some, though not as much as said interesting quote from her, because we're led to believe that he basically memorized the Bible. This is his first textbook, he, and, and Sarah brought it with her when she came to Indiana. It's very famous, was used nationally, Noah Webster spelling book. Now, don't get the misconception that this is a book of words that you just learn how to spell. This spelling book and Dilworth, which was also famous, the Kentucky Preceptor, these spelling books taught spelling, but they also used literature. They had essays, poems, they had soliloquies in them, and they would use those to take words and teach them how to spell. And <clears throat> they contained the rudiments of the English language, but more importantly, they were a moral catechism. Lincoln himself said the main rule of the teacher was to learn us manners. And those of you of my generation Remember that the teachers would call two of us up to the front of the room, pair us up, and they would teach us how to introduce ourselves properly to one another, um, how to communicate properly. They taught us how to answer the telephone appropriately. And this was done in these schools. It was a main part of their teaching, learning manners, morals, and ethics. And in Noah Webster, it's filled with this. So I thought I'd give you three examples. So Noah Webster picks out the word humility and he asks the questions, what are the advantages of humility? The answer is the humble man has no enemies, everyone loves him. The word mercy, the question is, should not beasts as well as men be treated with mercy? The answer, it is wrong to give needless pain even to a beast. You all know the turkey story that Lincoln shot and the great remorse he felt probably learned from this. Peacemakers, the question, who are peacemakers? Answer, all who endeavor to prevent quarrels and disputes among men. Now, Lincoln, as you probably know, when he was a lawyer, did everything he could to dissuade his clients from suing. I mean, he would say, go back to your neighbor, sit down with them, discuss the problem, try to reason with them and see if the two of you can't work out a solution. Because I guarantee, if you sue and it goes to court, the only one that is gonna win is the lawyer. Well, this is the other second book Sarah brought along that Lincoln basically 
learned cover to cover Aesop's fables. Um, and again, this is a book of morals, right? Short stories, parables, each one having an important lesson. The one I happen to remember most as a kid is the fox and the crow, where the crow is sitting on a branch with a morsel of food. You can see the fox is salivating. So the fox says, you are the most beautiful bird in all of God's kingdom. You have the shiniest, smartest black feathers of any bird, but most importantly, uh, your song is the most beautiful song. Would you please just sing me something? So the flattered crow opens up his mouth to sing a song, drops the morsel into the waiting jaws of the wolf. And the moral, Aesop tells us, is the flatterer lives at the expense of those who will listen to him. So this is the type of early school learning that Lincoln went through, and it certainly left an impression on him. Now, the first real book he came across was the famous Mars Parson Weems' uh, Life of George Washington. This book has become famous because of Abraham Lincoln, but it's not just a biography. Any of you that have bothered to take a look at it, um, it's a history of the Revolutionary War. You know, on Lincoln's inaugural trip to Washington, he stops at state capitals, always being careful not to say anything inflammatory because states are seceding as he's traveling. By the time he gets to Washington, seven is seceding. Well, he gets to Trenton and he, in his speech, he goes into this book and tells what a great impression it made upon him and how he was impressed. I, I don't have time to read uh, part of his speech he gave, but he put a great deal of emphasis on this book. Turns out it was the first book he personally owned and I'll show you. Oh, of course, this again has morals in it to teach children. Um, and here you see, I think it's Grant Wood's painting of George Washington and his father in the famous cherry tree where his father said, George, who chopped down my cherry tree? And of course, George Washington being the man he was, even though a boy, as you can see, said, father, I cannot tell a lie, it was I. And so once again, this is reinforcing morals and ethics on these young children as, as, as they're growing up. And it certainly made an impression on honest Abe never to tell a lie. Well, he borrowed the book from his nearest neighbor, Josiah Crawford. And Crawford later in his interview said, while other boys are out hooking watermelons, that's stealing, Abe was home reading. Now, an Indiana cabin, Lincoln and his sister Sarah and a cousin Sophie uh, Hanks was living there. They slept in the loft. And this is the very ingenious ladder, pegged ladder that goes up to the loft where they slept. I took this picture when I visited that cabin some years back. So Lincoln would take a candle and weems and go up there and read it um, before he went to sleep. And he would finish, he would tuck that book in a little nook between the logs. And one night was a horrific rainstorm. Um, and the book became soaked, just completely soaked. And so he returned the book to Josiah Crawford when he was done. <laughs> and Josiah Crawford, of course, said, no way. I'm not taking that book back. That book is ruined. So he said, you're going to have to pay me for the book. Well, of course, Lincoln had no source of income or money to pay for the book. So he, Crawford made him work for him. So Lincoln spent the next six days, shucking corn and weeding and doing all sorts of things around the farm for Josiah Crawford. Now, Lincoln even mentioned this, he resented it because as you know, he didn't like manual labor. He didn't like farm work, but he felt it was just. And so at the, he was paid 25 cents a day, by the way. So at the, at the end, he had paid for the book, but now it was his book. He owned it and it was the first book he ever owned. So that's probably why he also had a very special attachment to it. Well, at the age of 19, 1828, the second great tragedy in his life occurs when Sister Sarah dies at the age of 21 in childbirth. And Aaron Grigsby, her husband, uh, told Herndon that he was the first one. He went to Lincoln, who was working uh, at his father's, at Thomas's smokehouse. And when he told Lincoln that his sister had died, Sarah, he said Lincoln collapsed on the ground, put his face in his two hands and just sobbed uncontrollably. 
um, and rightfully so. I mean, this this girl cared for Lincoln when he was very young, he was his constant companion at all times, and he lost her. Um, it, it caused quite a breach between Lincoln and the Grigsby's, we won't go into. This is, at least it was, I think, in 1990 or 1988, the Little Pigeon Creek Church, uh, built on the site of the original log cabin church that Thomas Lincoln actually built for the community. You see, standing here, oops, you see the woman in the picture is your former president of the Lincoln Group, Joan Chaconis. Uh, Joan joined Pat, my wife, and my younger daughter, Betsy, and ourselves on one of the tours we did of the Lincoln Trail. And there's where Sarah's buried in the back. So if you get on the trail again, this is a little side trip. You really ought to go there and, and visit the cemetery in the Little Pigeon Creek Church. Well, I don't know if this is covered up on your screen like it is on, uh, on mine, but two months after Sarah died, Lincoln at age 19 is approached by James Gentry, the store owner, the, the mercantile dealer in the community. And he said, I want you, Abe, and my son, Alan Gentry, to take a load of goods down the Mississippi to New Orleans and sell them. So Lincoln, of course, jumped at the opportunity. He was being paid to do this. They had to build this boat from scratch, that is from trees. And the two of them, Alan and Lincoln, built the flat boat, launched it at Rockport, uh, full of goods, and headed down the Ohio River to the Mississippi. Now, this is a trip that covers 1,500 miles by water, 800 as the crow flies, um, 66 to 70 miles a day, uh, 14 hours a day on average. It took 25 days to get to New Orleans. Um, I want to throw this in because, again, this is one of these books that I think is one of the top books that belong in every Lincoln Library by Richard Campanella. You might wonder why two flatboat trips were that significant, but he's done amazing research into these trips and everything about Lincoln's life that surrounds them. Um, and probably, not probably, but clearly has done the best research in the field beyond question. Definitely should have won the Gilder Lehrman Prize in my opinion. So here you see the Mississippi, you know, from, from Cairo, Il uh, Cairo, Illinois, all the way down to Vicksburg. And look at this twisting, turning river. You know, there are times when these guys are actually going north instead of south as they go down, go, go down this river. Well, the question hopefully you should be asking that I asked originally is why? Why did James Gentry take a, have these kids take a boatload of goods all the way down the Mississippi River on a 1,400 mile trip to New Orleans. And this figures into Lincoln's political life too. And the reason this occurred is because there's no infrastructure out on the frontier. There are no railroads, there are no turnpikes, there are no canals. There is no way to move goods an appreciable distance in any direction. Uh, and Lincoln is keenly aware of this. And this is why Lincoln, um, uh, has as his original platform plank when he starts running for the legislature infrastructure because he realizes the only way the United States is going to grow and expand and succeed is if people out on that frontier can can thrive and and move their goods and sell them. Other than that, their subsistence farming. I mean, if Thomas Lincoln plants forty acres. Half of it's gonna rot in the field because what's he gonna do with his surplus crop? So Gentry comes along, he cuts a deal with certain farmers and he buys some pigs and cattle and all their surplus crops and sends them down to New Orleans because that's, believe it or not, the closest, easiest market to get to because the entire trip is by water. They never set foot on land at any point. By the way, this is the particular trip where they tie up 60 miles north of New Orleans and as Lincoln says, seven Negroes at night entered the barge, attempted to kill the two men and steal all the goods. But Gentry and Lincoln fought them off. According to Gentry, at one point, Lincoln yells to Gentry, go get the gun and shoot them, at which point um, the Negroes panicked and uh, fled. So they untied the barge, even though it was after midnight and continued a trip down to 
New Orleans. Well, this must have been culture shock. Remember, this kid probably didn't wander more than five miles from home, six at the most. He walks into the city of over 40,000, one of the two major ports in the United States, teeming with people that speak three languages, French, Spanish, and English. There are buildings, houses, stores, brothels. Um, there's just about everything. And uh, in the week that Lincoln and Gentry docked in New Orleans, the Picayune newspaper of New Orleans listed 158 barges that docked that same week. So this is a big deal. So by hook or crook, any way they can, wholesale and retail, they sell off all the goods. Then they dismantle, tear the barge apart and sell the lumber. And then there are no steamboats, so they make their way on foot by canoe and horse back up home again. Well, one of the things Lincoln saw the first time he was exposed um, to a slave auction. So he and Alan Gentry wandered into a slave auction. Gentry describes this in some detail. A young, very attractive black girl is being auctioned off and he says she's being pinched and poked and prodded and forced to walk back and forth amongst the potential buyers to see what a good buy she would be. And Lincoln becomes thoroughly disgusted um, and outraged at this. And this is where the famous quote from Lincoln comes, if I ever get a chance to hit that thing, I'll hit it hard. Again, this is controversial amongst historians, but it actually comes from Alan Gentry's wife, Anna, who said when they got back, Alan told Anna that this is Lincoln's reaction to what he saw and what he said. Well, on February 12th, 1830, Lincoln turns 21. He reaches the age of majority. He no longer is bound to his father. Now, many of the states, although there are at this time, Illinois is the 18th state, Indiana is the 18th state. Uh, most states have by law, uh, uh, the law of majority where children uh, belong to their fathers uh, completely under his control until the age of 21. And this applies to girls as well as boys age 21. It's the age of majority at which they are now free and independent on their own. However, John Hanks, Nancy's cousin, and Lincoln's second cousin, a man that Lincoln really admired uh, very much, had moved to Illinois from Indiana and wrote back to Tom and said, you've got to come here. It's the most fertile land we've ever lived on. It, it, it's an excellent place. The land is cheap. So Thomas decides to go. So he pulls up stakes and moves uh, to an area just uh, a little bit east of Decatur, Illinois, which you see is just to the east of Springfield, the capital. Lincoln agrees uh, to go to help the family move, even though he turns 21, um, and builds a cabin on the Sangamon River where they first locate. And <clears throat> at that point, the heavy snows hit and the famous big snow of Illinois occurs. It's such a heavy snowfall that snow drifts are as high as 15 feet. Everyone is snowbound in their cabins. Lincoln passes his 22nd birthday in February, but come March, um, the snow begins to thaw and melt. Um, John Hanks shows up at the Lincoln cabin and says that he's been hired by this entrepreneur in Springfield, Denton Ofoot, who has a load of goods he wants sold in New Orleans, and he's hired John Hanks to build a flatboat and take the, to New Orleans. So John Hanks goes to Tom Lincoln's cabin and offers Abraham and uh, Sarah's son, Lincoln's stepson, John D. Johnston of the famous letter later, um, if they wanna join him. Of course, both guys jump at the opportunity. I think um, John is one year younger than Abraham. Abraham now is 22, John's 21. And so they go to Beardstown, and from trees, they start to build a flatboat, load it with goods, launch it on the Sangamon River and start to head to the Ohio. And um, you know the famous story. The flatboat gets hung up on the cofferdam uh, uh, of the Camerons at, at New Salem, and it begins to take on water. And it looks as if it's gonna be a disaster that the cargo is gonna get flooded and lost. The entire village in New Salem turns out on the banks to watch this potential disaster where Lincoln 
leaves the boat, walks into the village to Henry Onstutz, the cooper, and he borrows an auger. And he comes back and to everyone's shock, he drills a hole in the bow of the barge, allowing all the water to run out, which he then plugs. The barge is light and slips over the coffer dam and they can go on their merry way to New Orleans, which they do. Well, while all this is taking place, Denton Offord walks into New Salem, looks around and says, by God, this is an ideal place. I'm gonna open up my next store here. So on the way back from New Orleans, he tells Lincoln he's gonna open up this store and he wants Lincoln to clerk it. So Lincoln jumps at the opportunity and this brings Lincoln to the next phase of his life uh, from 1831 to the end of the story, 1837 from ages 22 to 28. Benjamin Thomas, um, the great Lincoln historian, says this was Lincoln's university, and indeed it was. This village, it's got about 28 buildings in it. At any given time, it has 125 people, total somewhere around 250 people overall. But it has a large number of highly educated, even college educated people in the village, and they hold seminars. Um, on a regular basis. This is right down Lincoln's alley. And it is here that Lincoln is introduced to what would be all of the college level teaching and courses that anyone would get. Starting with this man, Jack Kelso, he lived in this double cabin with Joshua Miller with the dog walk in between. And Jack Kelso was a fan of William Shakespeare and he had to complete plays of Shakespeare and he introduces them to Lincoln and Lincoln takes to Shakespeare like a duck to water. He reads them avidly. Um, Macbeth becomes his favorite. Um, it's clearly stated by many people that he actually memorized Macbeth to the point where he could stand up and he could quote lines for it in sol soliloquies um, on cue. Uh, when he rode the Eighth Circuit of Illinois, uh, when he was a lawyer, and the lawyers would break, you know, at the end of court day and gather around the fireplace in the inn, they always demanded Lincoln get up and recite Shakespeare. And Lincoln loved it, and they loved it, and he had a great time doing it. Um, William Green, later one of his partners, said he nearly knew Shakespeare by heart. Um, and Lincoln demonstrated that on multiple occasions. His favorite poet that he was introduced to was Robert Burns. Um, Lincoln never commented why he was his favorite poet. Well, the poems, of course, but Burns and Lincoln kind of had uh, a common uh, upbringing. They're both born in, in uh, dirt floored log cabins in pinching circumstances. Burns, much more than Lincoln, his father was sent to debtor's prison, plunging the family into absolute destitute. Uh, and a lot of this is reflected in Burns's poems, which are very e egalitarian, which appeals greatly to Lincoln. But also Burns uh, liked to poke his finger in the eye of religion. And one of his most famous poems, Holy Willie, uh, was one of Lincoln's most favorite <laughs> poems in which this is a poem which attempts to show the hypocrisy that exists in many religions. His second favorite poet was Edgar Allan Poe, and he said his favorite poem was The Raven. And that kind of fits with Lincoln, doesn't it? This is dark, gloomy, sort of forbidding poem. And it fits well with those periods of Lincoln when he slips into depression, uh, what he refers to as the black dog. Well, <clears throat> he returns to New Salem uh, from his trip, uh, and uh, the Black Hawk War breaks out along the Illinois-Wisconsin frontier. Governor Oglesby calls up the militia. Everyone in the state between the ages of 18 and 35 obligatory had to join the militia. Of course, Lincoln signs up and joins. 90 other people from the vicinity join, and much to his surprise and great delight, they elect him captain of the company. And of course, as you know, in those days, soldiers elected their officers. Um, Lincoln uh, served 30 day enlistments twice. Um, the second time he re-enlisted as a private uh, in the same outfit that John T. Stewart, the famous lawyer that he would become a partner to 
uh, when he leaves New Salem. Um, as I said, he never saw combat, but he was part of a burial detail where at Stillman's Run, uh, they, he arrived with his group of men the day after the battle, and it was strewn with the dead bodies of militiamen that had been stripped, badly mutilated, and scalped, and it was Lincoln's job to gather these men up and give them appropriate burials. There's a cemetery now with a wonderful monument to this. He returns from the Black Hawk War, and within two weeks, there's an election for the Illinois State Legislature. So Lincoln throws his hat into the ring. Boy, this is, this is what he really is excited about. And he runs for the state legislature and loses. It's the only election where he ran where he lost the popular vote. But in his district, he got 277 out of 300 votes, which really um, pleased him immensely, as you can well imagine, and, and further stimulated him in the field of politics. Well, from 32 to 33, he was a store clerk. In the upper left, you see the Lincoln Berry store, William Berry. He joined in partnership. Lincoln used the money. He was paid for his service in the Black Hawk War. He used that to acquire this store. And then the following year in 33, he and Berry rolled it over into a store owned by Reuben Radford in New Salem, a much larger store that in all its inventory. The trouble is it put Lincoln into debt. Um, which he couldn't pay off. And as he said, the store winked out. Um, and so he failed in both enterprises. In 33, then, when the store winked out, he was appointed postmaster in New Salem, which is interesting because in those days, the president of the United States appointed postmasters even to little villages like New Salem. That was Andrew Jackson, a Democrat. Lincoln's a Whig. Um, but yet all of the Democrats in New Salem recommended to Jackson, Lincoln to be postmaster. So Jackson appointed a postmaster. Lincoln said it was a trivial job. It paid very little, but Lincoln got first crack at all the newspapers that came in, um, which he of course was very much attracted to. There are any number of anecdotal references later in Hearn and of people who said when they went to pick up their newspaper, they can tell because they had been folded, unfolded, and refolded several times. They knew Lincoln had been reading them all. Well, um, John Calhoun, the deputy surveyor uh, for the county, uh, came to Lincoln knowing that he was the brightest guy in the village and said, Lincoln, I, I can't handle all the business that's coming my way. I need a deputy, and I want you to deputy be my deputy surveyor. Well, of course, Lincoln said, I don't know the first thing about surveying. Uh, how can I be your deputy? So what did Calhoun do? He gave him his book, Gibson's famous book on theory, practice of surveying. And Lincoln did what he always did. He dove into it, hammer and nail, read it cover to cover and became a surveyor, a very good one. Uh, this is the first full-time job that, that paid that Lincoln had, procured bread and kept body and soul together, he said. And it was well-paying, $2.50 a quarter section. He even got $2 a day traveling expense. Lincoln laid out in their entirety the towns of New Boston, Bath, New Albany, Huron, and Petersburg. Uh, Petersburg became the county capital. Uh, I've been to both Petersburg and Huron, and right in the center of the town where he started the surveys is a large circular bronze plaque indicating that this is where Lincoln began the surveys of these towns. Well, here's his real teacher, Mentor Graham, the school teacher, college educated, um, and he introduced Lincoln to that famous book you're all familiar with, Kirkham's English Grammar. Here is the book in the Library of Congress Rare Vault. Um, and I was so fortunate that one of our own Lincoln Group members, Clark Evans, was in charge of uh, that rare book section and the vault. And on one lunch period, he invited me down, took me into the vault, and let me handle this book, if you can believe it. And um, you can't imagine the feeling of actually holding the book that you knew that Lincoln held and Ann Rutledge held and studied from to learn their grammar. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Um, Lincoln said he studied English grammar and perfectly, of course, but so as to speak and write as well as he now does. Once again, he's being modest and denigrating himself. 
This is the man that wrote the Gettysburg Address, the second inaugural, the farewell speech at Springfield. And yes, Bixby letter. Lincoln did write the Bixby letter, not John Hay. <clears throat> you see the signatures Anne M. Rutledge is now learning her grammar. There are those that believe Lincoln wrote that in Kirkham's grammar. Um, I don't believe he did. I believe James Rutledge wrote it. This is a receipt Rutledge received from Lincoln, which he pasted in the front cover. He wound up owning the book and it descended through their family before it wound up with a private collector and then the Library of Congress. So, you know, here he meets Ann Rutledge. This is the legend, his first love. I talked to you at great lengths about this at one of uh, my uh, earlier Zoom meetings, I believe. Uh, so as the story goes, they fall in love, they become engaged, only to have Ann die tragically of typhoid fever, throwing Lincoln into a very deep depression, uh, so deep that several of his friends and neighbors thought that he might commit suicide. Um, the third great tragedy in his life. So he's one of those presidents who suffered tragedy in his life and developed a tremendous empathy for people. I showed you this uh, table uh, the last time I spoke on Anne Rutledge. So I'm going to show it to you again because it illustrates my point of these first 28 years. Here are 22 very well-known historical um, historians. You know all of them. You know how eminent they are. And on the question of this love affair and marriage, and I did not manipulate the list, the 22 split right down the middle. 11 say yes, they did fall in love. They were engaged to be married. And 11 say, no, it's the myth. There's nothing to it. And the point that I want to make is these 22 historians are all looking at exactly the same data. Uh, the yeses have nothing, the noes don't have, and the noes don't have anything the yeses don't have. How can 22 eminent scholars in the field of Lincoln look at the same data and come to opposite conclusions? And that's the difficulty with these first 28 years, which are almost all anecdotal. So Lincoln finally finds his calling in New Salem. He's elected to the Illinois legislature the second time he runs in 34. He's reelected in 36, and he will be reelected in 38, 40 when he's in Springfield. But while in the Illinois state legislature, he meets John T. Stewart, uh, the famous Springfield lawyer that Lincoln will become a partner with. Stewart is so impressed with Lincoln that he encourages him to study law and lends him his law library. Lincoln does it again. He dives into these books, Hammer and Nail. And in 1836, while in New Salem, he is admitted to the Illinois bar. And in 1837, at the age of 28, he packs all of his belongings into two saddlebags and he rides off into Springfield, Illinois, and a new cosmopolitan life. And so, Lincoln morphs from this rough, unhewn frontiersman of 28 years into the cosmopolitan lawyer, politician, and future president of the United States. So here endeth the lesson, and thank all of you for inviting me. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. You want me to unshare this? Okay, Ed. <laughs> And thank you very much once again. Your uh, extraordinary research really brings this story uh, more to life, gives us a, a more copious background on how the facts that we think we know about Lincoln got originally interpreted. Uh, we will throw the floor open to questions. Uh, if uh, Feel free to use the chat function if you want to uh, put a question in. And I will uh, bring it up at the right time. Uh, but otherwise, unmute yourselves and feel free to uh, ask yet a question. Ed, this is Karen Haubecker. I'm wondering about Ann Rutledge and the historians that don't think there was a role. What is the primary factor that convinces them of that? Well, I think the father of that is James G. Randall, who is the godfather of all Lincoln historians, 
who says uh, these are reminiscences uh, and statements from people uh, 30 to 35 years later. They're dim and misty memories. Um. Um, and we all know that with time, all memory uh, becomes contaminated and, and they just simply uh, don't believe it. As I tried to indicate in a talk I gave last time, there are 24 people who attest to this. But as I also told you last time, Lincoln and Ann Rutledge were together in New Salem for only 10 months, even though they birthed their six years because Ann moves out to Sand Ridge and while the 10 months they're in New Salem, Anne is still writing to John McNamara, the man she's engaged to. So whatever mm. romance took place, took place at Stone Ridge, eight miles outside of New Salem. So how did these 24 New Salem people ever see them engaged in any type of romantic situation? That's the nose argument um, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, on the other side of the coin, there are the 20 four people make this story up? Are they lying or is it just a misconception? It's hard to accept that. Um, uh, and the other side of that coin is who doesn't want to believe this? I mean, it's, it's right out of Shakespeare for God's sake. So, you know, this, this beautiful girl and Abraham Lincoln dying tragically of typhoid fever. Yeah. So, you know, you pick your choice. Pick your choice, but you got to go to Herndon to do it. You have to go to Herndon to do it. And this is one of the criticisms of Herndon. All right. Thank you. Scott. Hi, Ed. How are you? I'm fine, Scott. Good to see you. Good to see you too, my friend. Hey, I had a question. You know, you had mentioned certainly about the Lincolns moving from Kentucky to Indiana. So a couple of the questions I have are related to the Lincolns and their religious background how that may have contributed, if it did, to the movement to Indiana, and then how Lincoln's early religious upbringing maybe formulated his thought processes moving forward, even his political beliefs. Yeah, well, that's another talk. Um, <laughs> it's another two talks. Um, well, the Lincolns, that is Tom and Nancy and Tom and Sarah, were what known as hard shell Baptists uh, or free will Baptists. They're uh, the Baptist church, particularly through the South and on the frontier, there were dozens of sects of baptism. The particular one they belonged to, free will, was <laughs> extremely liberal. Um, uh, they did not uh, enforce any of their doctrine or beliefs on anybody. You had to come at, to it yourself. They only accepted as part of the ritual of the church only two things, that is, communion and baptism, because they said they were the only two things that Christ himself actually participated in. Now, during this whole period and growing up in Indiana, Lincoln is never baptized. Um, with, and, and Nancy and Tom are extraordinarily religious, uh, as the rest of the Lincoln family is. But Lincoln is, is left on his own. He's, he's, he's not forced into the religion. He tends church sporadically during this period. He's not made to and as I indicated, he's not baptized, although after his death, the three different religious sects attempted to claim they baptized him because you can't get into heaven unless you're baptized. It's a canon of the church. And how could this great good man uh, not get into heaven? So they had to baptize him. And actually, uh, the Mormons also baptized him. That was the fourth religious sect that baptized him. In any event, um, the Lincolns, uh, that their church was very anti-slavery, and the, and the Baptist church split, as, you can, as all churches did in the South, pro-slavery and anti-slavery, and that was a contributing factor in the move, but the other contributing factor, as you know, he lost both farms because of faulty land titles. He paid cash outright for them. He owned both of them cash outright, but because of the faulty land titles, he lost both farms, and so he moved to Indiana. Now, in Indiana, the story continues. So why wasn't, why didn't they baptize Lincoln as a child, and why didn't they force him to go to church, and uh, like all other kids did, um, because they were yeah. liberal in their religion. Yeah. And I just mentioned it's one of the principles of the Baptist faith that they don't believe in uh, infant baptism. Uh, you have to make that decision on your own. And exactly. 
And, and if my memory recollects in, in the hard shell Baptist, that age was like 15. So you're talking about a teenager uh, before that decision is made and you have to make it yourself. Lincoln chose, chose, chose number to do it. Um, Ed, there's a, a question that uh, expresses disappointment that you didn't describe Lincoln's career as a wrestler. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> what would you like me to say? He, he, he was engaged in two wrestling matches. One was a draw and the other one he won. Um, but of course, this is another side of Lincoln. Uh, I love, you know, one of the, they always mention there are 15,000 books written on Lincoln. They're not. That includes articles, journal articles, magazine articles, but there sure are thousands of books. And one of them is Lincoln the Athlete, uh, which is a very interesting book um, because this guy was extraordinarily athletic and, and performed athletic tricks for people. You know, he would pick up uh, a, a keg that weighed over 200 pounds and he would hold it up over, over his head and pretend to drink from it. Um, he used to hold uh, an axe out at arm's length just with his fingertips. And, you know, Woodward, when he when he performed the autopsy on Lincoln in the White House, said they were just absolutely amazed at the muscle tone of his body at the age of uh, 56. So um, the wrestling match that took place in New Salem took place very early. And it was sort of Lincoln's initiation uh, or hazing into the gang of, of Clary's Grove boys that were the toughs that sort of ran that part of New Salem. And so Lincoln was challenged to wrestle Jack Armstrong in the famous wrestling match. And there are as many interpretations of that wrestling match as there are books. Um, there was a, a figure thrown about 300 matches. That it, Do you put any stock in that? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> there was a very interesting incident where uh, he got into an argument with uh, Nathan Grigsby, and um, uh, it was to be settled with a fight, but uh, everyone admitted Lincoln was much too strong, much too far powerful to fight Grigsby. It was a totally uneven match. And so John D. Johnston was Lincoln's proxy stand-in, and he fought Nathan Grigsby in New Salem. This is a very famous fight because it really took, got very bad. Uh, uh, Griggs, Grigsby was very badly injured till Lincoln finally stepped in, in and uh, and and through um, the other guy. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, John D. Johnson, uh, his stepbrother got very badly injured until, until Lincoln stepped in and threw Grigsby. But, but that, that, is, that was a very famous fight that took place, famous amongst the people that lived in the Pigeon Creek community. They talked a great deal about it. Um, but Lincoln had great athletic prowess. There, there's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Americans are countering uh, right now, uh, a quick, quick question about wrestling. Did he, uh, I'll turn off the TV. Uh, why is that not an, an um, did, why, why did Lincoln, why, why were there so many wrestling matches? So was it a pastime? And right now in the United States of America. This is John Swallow, hello. Yes, why, why were there so many wrestling matches? Because that was the game of the day. There was no football, soccer, baseball, or basketball. When you got out with guys, what did you do other than drink? You know, you wrestled. Um, that's uh, a lot better than fist fights. And so re wrestling was a very common, I mean, during the Black Hawk War, almost every night, they would have guys pair off and, and have wrestling matches. Lincoln had several wrestling matches with guys during the Black Hawk War. It's, it, it's fun in games amongst young testosterone men. <laughs> Ed, there's a, a question requesting a more background on the Bixby controversy. Why was it controversial? And why do uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I talked to your group about that and I thought I presented the evidence. I go into it in some detail mm -hmm. um, in this, you know, getting right with Lincoln. It's Michael mm -hmm. Burlingame. That's the only source for this, really. Okay. Um, and um, so Michael came up with what he thought was evidence that proved that John Hay was actually the author. Uh, I think at every level, Michael's research in this area, Michael's a great researcher, is very flawed. And I thought I effectively answered each of his reasons why John Hay wrote it. I think there's, abs I think there's absolutely no doubt Lincoln wrote it. 
Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if it is controversial because uh, how many people believe it? I, I, I've never seen a poll. I've never asked a group of people like the Lincoln Group or the Lincoln Forum. How many believe that John Hay now wrote it? Uh, Burlingame, being who he is and what he represents, was able to convince people, uh, unfortunately. And what I was trying to do was untie that knot. Um, uh, he's, his, his, and, and I attacked that uh, computer study that was made in Birmingham, England by going to the real pro in Germany, a guy named Thomas Prozel, who, who, who demonstrated that their computer program analysis was deeply flawed. Uh, and he agreed with me that Lincoln wrote the Bixby letter, not John Hay. But if you wanna find out about it in detail, read the chapter in my book, called identity theft. I would suggest that we settle this with uh, Ed Steers and Michael Burlingame having a wrestling match. <laughs> that would be unfair. He's so much, uh, so much younger and stronger than I am. I suggest that David step in as my proxy. Uh, that, then, you, then you would be losing. Um, I, I, I have a question. Um, I wonder if you can put his education into more context. Um, he, he talks about less than a year of formal schooling and it was split up. So that part, you know, how, how does that compare to everybody else in Little Pigeon Creek and in, in, in the frontier? And then the second part is his self-schooling. Um, is he unusual in doing all of this reading and self-schooling compared to uh, his peers at the time. Well, the answer to the second question, this is just my opinion. Everything I've said is my opinion, of course. But <clears throat> um, every, all of us, most of us do a certain amount of self-education. Now, Dan, I'm a scientist. You're a scientist, David. How did we get into the Lincoln field and learn what we did about Lincoln? Well, we read books <laughs> and we read documents and we learned and we were self-taught and self-educated in that area. But Lincoln takes it of several levels beyond. Um, one of the attributes he has is a very good memory. He seems to be able to remember things very easily, but only things he cares about. Um, you know, maybe some of you are like this. If you don't have an interest in something, it's very difficult to learn it, to understand it and retain it. But if, you, if you're really interested in it, you know, I went through high school, college, um, did very poorly in subjects other than science, biology, math, chemistry, um, and the same happened in, in, in college, just I couldn't have the interest in them. And, and I think Lincoln was that way, except he, he took it to a next level. Uh, I don't know how you can measure his IQ. I know that the IQs of the presidents have been measured. I absolutely don't know what tests they applied to them. And of course, Lincoln does not rank at the top, but he certainly ranks in the top 10. Um, and so um, Lincoln uh, also had this other facility that I mentioned just briefly and skipped over. When he didn't understand something, he became extremely frustrated. And he would go back over, uh, Sarah said, again and again and again until he finally had it fixed and had the answer. And it was fixed in his mind and he never forgot it. The first part of your question about the frontier um, I, I haven't seen too much data on it except this extraordinary 75% literacy. Um, so these people were reading, obviously they were reading, but their reading is very limited. I mean, the libraries are very limited, the books that are available to them. Um, but my point is this, uh, and I, I mentioned this in uh, reading, writing, and ciphering to the rule of three. Why in God's name of the frontier do you even need to be able to read or write? Um, you're spending every day, almost uh, every day of every week of month, uh, cutting down trees, dragging out stumps, plowing fields, hunting day after day to kill meat to eat, um, subsistence farming. There isn't any aspect of that you need to be able to read, write, or cipher to the rule of three. You can do all of that without it. So education, and this is what they try to pin on Thomas Lincoln. Education is just fluff. Um, it doesn't really matter and it doesn't really mean things and you're wasting time on it. And of course, Thomas never thought that, although that's kind of the label that's been stuck on him. Um, so uh, 
Uh, I don't know the extent of scholarship out on the frontier, but uh, there certainly are authors out there. And uh, there's certainly um, 10 of our presidents were born in log cabins basically on the frontier and they rose to president. Now, now some of them did not do that by their intellect by any means, um, but they certainly weren't done. So, uh, but the frontier of course, educationally was quite different I believe than the urban area of America in, in, in many ways. But every community that Lincoln belonged to had these Athenian societies, you know, the Philomathian society where people got together once a month and somebody gave a talk, a lecture, a discussion on a subject. So there are people learning, yearning to learn, and they actually go through these formal exercises of monthly meetings, um, even on even even on the frontier. And the Lyceum movement was uh, an interesting part of that. Uh, the men in New Salem had some interest in bettering themselves this way. Yes, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, well, the, several of those Philomathian societies, uh, Lyceum societies exist today. I belonged to one in Philadelphia when I was in college. So, um, and they're kind of like the Lincoln group. People get together to hear a particular subject or topic and learn about it. It's not any part of their career. It's not any part of their livelihood. They're never gonna earn a penny from it. Certainly those of us that write books, David, are not earning any pennies from it. <laughs> we probably spend more money than we take in in royalties. Uh, from this. Scott, uh, what do you have? <laughs> Unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, and I had a question. Now, you mentioned Lincoln and his connection with the law through John Todd Stewart. You didn't, you didn't talk about supposedly Lincoln's first case where he represented himself uh, in Indiana. Yes. I'm just curious if you were familiar, and if you are, if you could share a little bit about yes, that. Yes, yes. Uh, there, there was a moment when, when Lincoln was a ferryman uh, as a teenager where he uh, had built a boat and um, would ferry people out uh, to steamships that, that would stop periodically uh, on the Ohio. Um, and I'm sure you know the famous story where he took two gentlemen out uh, to a steamboat. And when they got on the steamboat, each threw a silver half dollar into his boat. Uh, and Lincoln, this is one thing Lincoln actually talks about in his autobiography, you know, he thought he was the richest man in the world. He owned a dollar uh, in silver from these two guys. Well, uh, the ferry that ran the at Anderson Creek across the river filed a lawsuit against Lincoln because he wasn't licensed. And Lincoln represented himself, young man that he was in court. The judge was Judge Posey, if I remember. Samuel Pate. It was Samuel Pate was the judge. Okay, Samuel Pate. Thank you. Scott. Um, and Lincoln's point was that he was not ferrying people across the river. He was only taking them out to the middle and then coming back. And um, the judge said, good point, not guilty. <laughs> so we got off. <laughs> but, you know, this is Lincoln, this, this magnificent mind. The reason I got into this, and I'm, I'm writing a book now, beginning at 1500, it's called The Lincoln Tree, all the way down to Lincoln. Every Lincoln generation down to Thomas was highly successful. They, there are 11 of them. They're wealthy, they're large landowners, they're peers in their community. Every single ancestor of Lincoln, I'm not talking about the collaterals, I'm talking about the direct ancestry, were all highly successful in whatever field they entered. They entered weaving, iron, mongering, um, uh, mercantile, and they were all very successful. Um, and so, um, you know, a person's uh, intellect is both a function of nature and nurture, your genes and your environment. And they tend to denigrate and downgrade uh, Lincoln's uh, genes in the sense that he comes from Southern white trash. That is, that's always character, the Hanks. You know, you can't get more Southern white trash than the Hanks. And then there's Tom Lincoln, this shiftless failure of a man who fathered him. Um, and so Lincoln himself said that he owed his uh, cognitive abilities and intellect to this unknown aristocratic Southern planter who took advantage of his grandmother, Lucy Hanks, and made her pregnant 
giving birth to Nancy Hanks, his mother. So the, his genes for intellect came from this aristocratic planter through Lucy, uh, um, uh, through Nancy. Um, when in fact, um, Lincoln's ancestry is quite illustrious. I mean, uh, there's something there, uh, no doubt. And so that's what that, that's got me into this. And I'm, I'm, I, I tried to find out as much about these people as I could, you know, having a background in genetics. Um, but Lincoln, of course, is the self-made man, no doubt about it. I was surprised to hear you say that he didn't see that grammar book until he was in New Salem at the uh, age of about four, I guess. Uh, that was the first grammar book that he had? To the best of my knowledge, it was. Uh, one of the things I, you know, I had several things on my bucket list. One bucket list was to visit every Lincoln site in the United States, which I think I've basically done. The other was to have a copy of the actual uh, edition of every book that Lincoln read or owned. Um, mm -hmm. And I do, I have a couple dozen of them in, in the other room. And what I show you are from my collection and they are the editions that Lincoln had had and read. And I don't know anything prior to Kirkham's grammar. There's one grammar book. I can't remember the name of the guy um, and an elocution book. But I, as far as I know, that's the first grammar book. So where did Lincoln learn his grammar? What's his grammar good? Uh, prior to New Salem and Kirkham's grammar. What writing did he do that we have that would reflect it? I can't think of any other than that poem, which he didn't originate. Very good. Other thirst for it. Yeah. Uh, Ed, thank you very much. This is, uh, once again, an extraordinary presentation. We appreciate uh, all your, your fine work. Your great research comes to our benefit through conferences like this. Thank you. Well, thank you. I very much appreciate your asking me to share what I know with you. It's, it's always a lot of fun. Love the Lincoln Group. Um, like to see you take on that project of biblical quotations. It's, uh, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Good. Lincoln Group in 1960, 1960, I think was quite different. Uh, I, I think than, than the Lincoln group of today in many ways. Um, uh, but that, that was their main project. Yeah. yeah. Good, good. Our, uh, our next speaker a week from today, uh, the 13th, will be a fellow by the name of David Kent, who has an interesting perspective on Lincoln, the politician. Uh, uh, David, I'll turn it back over to you. Huh? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. Yeah. So one week from today on the 13th, um, you'll have to listen to me for the whole time, uh, which I know will be painful for some people. But, uh, well, we're going to talk about Lincoln as, as a politician. So we, we're not really going to get much into his law degree, law, law practice, um, which is quite a course in itself. But uh, we'll talk about his, his time as a politician um, in, in Illinois and in the Congress and as president. Um, and then uh, the week after that, we'll do Commander in Chief. And the following last week of the month, that last Thursday of the month, uh, John O'Brien will come back and finish us up with Lincoln's legacy and, and delving into some key documents as well that, that uh, kind of show what, where Lincoln's feeling was. Um, one last thing I'll mention is uh, besides next Thursday, uh, on Tuesday the 18th, uh, Doris Keevan Frank, who is on here, will be our speaker to talk about Archer Alexander. Uh, that yes. is not to be missed, and uh, the Emancipation Memorial statue up in Lincoln Park is uh, something that is of interest to all of us and that our group has been involved with. And there'll be a lot more information coming out soon about the Lincoln Memorial plans, um, which, uh, needless to say, has been complicated by, uh, by Omicron that has uh, kind of caused a lot of our venues to, to kind of close shop until uh, and, and not uh, want to schedule anything. But other than that, uh, you know, everything's going fine. <laughs> so uh, we'll have more information on, on that soon. So I want to just thank everybody for, for being here and thank Ed for teaching the first session of this course. And I hope everybody will tune in to the next three sessions and bring your questions. We uh, we're not afraid of questions, even if we don't know the answer. Uh, <laughs> we make it up. 
<laughs> well, it, it'll give us a project to, uh, to, to, to find an answer if it's something we don't know. So anyway, thank you very much for everybody. And we'll see you hopefully next week at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank Dad. you.